Well, greetings from uh, Mesa Community College, uh, Black Student Union. Uh, we got a special guest today. Uh, he came here last year, and he uh, gave a very, very intriguing look on the African American uh, situation as is going on today. But he's a uh, musical, and he's also a great speaker. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to introduce Professor Grip, Public Enemy. Please give him a warm welcome. Greetings, how's everyone doing? Good. All right, how many people were here last year? Well, that's a beautiful thing. And why you got your right hand and put your left hand up and let me know if you walked through the museum. Because the young lady on the camera did not know that I came with the museum. <laughs> <laughs> I've been traveling with the museum for now um, 11 years, in case you didn't know. Wow. Colin has been collecting um, 26 years, 7,000 artifacts he's collected over the last 26 years. And I believe the exhibit, I kind of saw it, the, uh, the exhibit he has downstairs now is uh, all the way from slavery, and I think he got the three M's. The, uh, Malcolm, I think it's Danny Martin, Motown, and Michael Jackson. Yeah. So um, that's what he has down there now. So if you kind of walk through the museum, you can get a basic idea of the kind of work that he does, uh, and he has done over the last 26 years. Um, like I said, this is my second time here. And um, first time was kind of new, kind of spirited, all kind of people in the room, so you had to kind of um, touch different schools of thought. So what I'm going to do is just kind of dive into some things, do a fireside chat, and hopefully, probably in about an hour, we can kind of do a Q&A. All right, that's cool with everyone. How's everyone feeling? Good. Good. All right, cool. Makai, who owes me $3, she's like handling the, the phone to do Facebook Live, so if you don't, Want to be on film? Just kind of let me know if you got warrants or anything. Just kind of let me know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I'm gonna hit you a little bit late. Okay, we got you, though, sis. All right, all right cool. But um, let's give a round of applause for our good brother Khalid Del Akin, the curator for Black History 101 Mobile Museum. Let's give him a round of applause. He might be joining us to say a few words, but until he comes up. We'll just kind of roll with it, all right? Well, as you can see, this short little film clip we've kind of put together to give you an idea of what the mobile museum is, uh, is about. It's very difficult when you're talking about museums, especially a mobile museum. Right now, we're in the process of completing a film uh, entitled Artifactual. Um, of course, we think it's, uh, we know it's art. Um, of course, to us, it's factual. We put a big X in the middle of the word because in some cases, some of the artifacts are unknown to a lot of people. Um, and what we're doing in the film is we're actually documenting um, probably three to four hundred different artifacts and we're uh, interviewing people just around the country. Different ethnicities, uh, academia, some cats in the street, in the hood, students, whomever. Um, I think it's a beautiful task we're taking on simply because to go around the country and to sit and watch the people walk through the museum the, uh, the in, and interacting with the people, how they uh, kind of respond to some of the pieces. Um, some people don't want to touch it. Some people skip over the slavery part and go right to the music. Some people uh, start crying. One woman in, um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, actually wanted me to put the chains on her so she can feel what it's like to get that experience. And after uh, asking a few questions and having some dialogue, um, the water work started. She just busted out crying. I mean, not uncontrollable, but it took her a minute to bring the energy back down. To, uh, to wear chains around your neck, your wrists, and your ankle. Now, I'm not sure if you've seen, you seen the chains downstairs? Mm -hmm. Well, if you take a really good look at it, probably after we do this talk, you can go back down. One of the chains were designed to go around your ankle and around your wrist to the point where you're walking like this all day long, from the time you woke up to the time you went to bed. And you could only kind of pick cotton with your left hand, and you walked around like this. That was done and designed for two reasons. 
A, um, so you could become submissive. B, so you wouldn't escape. And then three, you, uh, after about you know five or ten years, you almost ended up like this permanently. All right. We're going to talk about some of the um, the ugly aspects of some of the things that's in the museum, but some of the other things so we can kind of move you out of your comfort zone. If you stay comfortable after walking through the museum and after having this dialogue and this talk, then I need to see y'all after class. Is that cool? Yeah. That was a joke, y'all. Don't get too serious, all right? <laughs> all right. So let's kind of dive into this a lot that I, that I have to um, I say. I'm going to try to kind of run through it. Is this the correct time? Yes. It's the same time on the tower back there outside? Uh -huh. Okay, cool. I'm going to pace myself, all right? Um, when I first looked up the pilot, I was doing an actual lecture called 911 is a joke to unholy war on terrorism. I think it was like uh, 01 um, when that was going down. When we kind of talked shortly after that, the students in Detroit uh, at the college, I mean, the school that he was teaching at, actually helped him uh, find this particular trailer, gut it out, paint it, and that became the museum. How many people are from, how many people from Michigan? Oh, then y'all know what I'm talking about, Detroit in the middle of the winter. Right, right, so we were actually in, in uh, bro, part of the Five Footer Club. We waited for you to introduce me, man, but brother, brother man right here to do the honors. Yeah, I'm sorry. So you might want to you know, cut him that check. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was a beautiful, humble beginning, and just like, like y'all in the audience, I was speaking, and I just met him. He told me what he was doing. I said, if you're serious, call me, and we'll talk about that. He called me. And for the last 11 years, I've been rolling with him um, to present this particular information. Um, first, I'm telling you this, but the first five years, there was no loot involved. I was like, damn, bro, he brought a brother a bean pie or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it was a labor of love, and I didn't mind, I, I didn't mind, I didn't mind doing it because it was a part of an extended overall mission of public enemy to raise the conscious level of the people, um, the human family. All right, I don't know if y'all remember the humble, early days of Public Enemy, when we used to perform uh, and open it up for the Beastie Boys, 20,000 white people in the audience, and he's like, yo, put your fish in the air <laughs> to the eight black people that was out in the audience. <laughs> it was a critical thing, but those same white people now grew up and understood the overall mission, and probably those white people were some of the same white people that voted for Barack Obama, if you could understand it in that way. All right. Um, they were radicalized and politi politicized at that particular time unbeknownst to them, all right? So, um, Kyle and Ashley uh, wrote two books from the time that I hooked up with them. Um, Drum Majors for Justice and the Center of the Movement. And I tell them all the time, um, the people that's putting together the DVD cover for the film, I'm like, this is not my film. This is not my work. I'm part of someone else's work, all right? This is actually his life's work coming out of college, being inspired by one of his, uh, one of his professors. There's a question that we normally ask, and I'm not going to put it on you today to put anyone on the spot. We ask this question every single time we travel throughout America uh, at community colleges um, just like this. We ask students, who's the father of Negro History Week? And it's always mute. We say, well, okay, well, then who's the father of Black History Month? And we know we don't get any answers. Some people say Frederick Douglass, Dr. King, Flavor Flav, some other crazy kind of stuff <laughs> we get. And we're like, no. You have to become familiar with the work of college you went to who gave us the miseducation uh, of the Negro. All right, he's the father of Black History Month. All right, we need to kind of kind of tuck that away in our um, mental Rolodex. So when we ask that question, we can actually have that particular um, discussion before we can even move forward. So I'm gonna move from this point of reference forward and just kind of you know move you out of your comfort zone, so to speak. Carter G. Woodson says, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. Um, normally at this point, I have a microphone. I kind of mumble it under my breath and name some people like Steve Harvey and some other people. Um, but it's a very critical thing because this particular dynamic is going on today. Bobby Henry calls them automatons, where you don't see them in the hood, but nonetheless, they're controlled by remote control. And they do the master's bidding right, without even being told. Um, Steve Harvey, you're on national TV, and say he doesn't even discuss um, uh, slavery. Common 
Kanye West and some other people. <laughs> and Kanye West, excuse me. And some other people. Um, and, and the ranks are filling up, you know, uh, at a rapid pace. But Carter G. Woodson says, you do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will protest until one is made for his use. His education demands it. And it speaks to that. This is a question that I need you to ask yourself right now as we move forward. What does your education demand and command you to do? All right? You don't have to necessarily answer that question to me, but answer it um, to yourself. And as I always ask, and I asked uh, the audience last year when I was here, what is your purpose in life? And what is your mission statement? All right? And this is a very critical question that we need to ask, and you need to ask for yourself. So real quick as we move along, let me give you mine, all right, that hopefully you can develop yours at least by the time we leave here, or by the time they invite you back, hopefully. All right? I have a purpose in life, and my mission statement for that purpose and life sounds something like this. I'm a soul in search of souls that are like minds, like mine. All right? One more time. I'm a soul in search of souls that are like minds, like mine. All right? What is it that you want to be in life? And then what is your purpose? And does your purpose connect with that particular thing? Not what your mom wants you to be, your dad, because they paid for school. All right? Not what your homeboy, your girlfriend, or your wife wants you to be, or your peers. All right? Did you get a call from the creator and answer that call and says, okay, this is what I want to do with my life's work. And step out with your left foot forward, trample the evil, and begin that mission. Once you begin that mission, you have to have a purpose and a mission statement to speak to that. All right? Once again, I'm a soul in search of souls that are like minds, like minds. So when I meet you and we're like-minded, there's a lot of things that we don't have to discuss, like who's the father of Black History Month. We should already know that. Am I right or wrong? Okay, let's move forward. The sad part about the whole dynamic of Black Mystery, I mean Black History Month, is this. Every, uh, every weekend is taken up by the people who would like to cause these kind of distractions. Not only distractions, they become the bump in the road, so to speak. So, well, this is the second week of Black History Month. We already got here with the Super Bowl. So where are we? First week. Grannies coming up, the second week. All-Star Weekend is the third week in the Oscars. When do we have a chance to get together to celebrate who and what we are? I went to the movies the other night and I saw the movie, um, uh, I'm Not Your Negro. I'm not even so. You have, to, you have to see the movie. James Baldwin actually put it down. He basically said, I am not who you say I am. We have to begin to define ourselves. You follow what I'm saying? Imagine a squirrel sending a little squirrels to rabbit school. <laughs> Now the rapper's got to define themselves through a squirrel's lens. All right, so France will now ask us to ask three questions. Who are we? What are we? Where are we at in this world? All right? So we have to be able to tackle these particular things. So with these particular distractions, we have to be able to develop programs like this. And let's give a round of applause for the people that developed this program to invite us back to the college. <laughs> We may think this is kind of lightweight, this is kind of like, I know you got to leave. You tell the supervisor, give me a call. Another 30 minutes, come on back, come and join us. Is that cool? All right. Um, we may kind of write these little fireside chats off, but my mission, along with the greater one, if I can just reach one or two people, I'm good. Something that will spark you and get you moving in that right direction. All right? Oh, you do? Would you like to come and give us some insight? No, oh, but I have to my check. All right. Yes. But this is a beautiful piece that I ran across online that I thought uh, it would be befitting to have this particular discussion or part of this discussion today. Stop complaining, it's the same distance. You black always pulling the race car. Well, we never had to pull the race car. But if we're starting out at the same point, but you have a ball and chain on our ankles, all right, um, and then obstacles in the way, then come on. All right? And this is one of those kind of things that I always say, pictures worth a thousand words. Brother Kwame and I said, of course the pictures worth a thousand words, but signs and symbols are worth a thousand pictures. Can you imagine that? A thousand pictures. And I'm going to talk about symbology, because there's images all around us that it's difficult on a psychic level to decode. And once we can decode them, um, because they're affecting our energy centers all the time. All right? 
You're going nowhere, any role will take you there. All right? Say that again. You're going nowhere, any role will take you there. All right? Frederick Douglass said it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Why do I say that? I say that simply because Frederick Douglass was one of those individuals that I might not agree with everything that he had to say, but I can pull and extract from the body of work that Frederick Douglass has given us, all right, and make it applicable today so I can use that as a tool to reach you, all right? Every Black History Month, I see stuff like this. Now, but because of the glare, you may not be able to make it out because the slide is not that clear. But this is an actual flyer that I, I got um, in the hood. All right? Uh, I had a dream birthday bash weekend, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, you understand what I'm saying? This is a shame. This is truly a shame on how we treat our leaders and then we expect other people from other countries, other ethnicities and nationalities to respect our leaders and give them respect when we don't. You put Dr. King on a cover and a half naked chick with Dr. King Balling out of control, making it rain up in the club. The birthday bash weekend. Here's another flyer. Free at last in the kid weekend. They got them blended out. Blended out, man. Just blended out. Dang. Can you imagine another country, China, <coughs> Russia, Israel, some other places, treating their leaders like this and their ancestors like this? This is ridiculous. Free at last. Ladies free all night. They got Dr. King and another cozy, looking like Slick Rick. Come on, man. This is no way that we should handle our ancestors during Black History Month. Why? Because everything is tied into your culture. Your culture is everything we think, everything we do. Culture is that vehicle that transports ideas, <coughs> traditions, norms, and values. It's to connect the old to the new. It's that vehicle. All right? It defines your enemy and structure and forms of people, which affects their paradigm, which is your worldview. All right? Culture protects the people from genocide. Culture is that people's primary source of education. Culture defines your relationship to the creator. Culture is your way of life. There's just certain things we do as black people. The other cultures are looking at us through a distorted lens may not understand. For example, I ran into this the other night. Culturally speaking, we may know what that is when I write a book. Could you and I have a discussion about that and we lock other people out that's not familiar with that? <laughs> I tried to have a conversation with an old girl the other night and it didn't work. I'm talking about an aisle 13 at Wally Work in Walmart. You understand what I'm saying? Or well, you catch her at Whole Food. See, I understand culturally what this is. Other people may not understand what got us to that particular point. Some people may not understand this. <clears throat> Me personally, at 56 years old, I survived all four of these gentlemen in the back. Has you ever experienced these when you were growing up? Yeah. Okay, yeah, because he's inside the realm of the culture. He may not, he may understand aspects of these. But how about those hot wheel tracks, bro? And that extension cord. Or you got those no. two? Oh, I'm about to say, bro. You probably grew up in the hood. Well, how about your mom made you go out and cut the switches down and braid them together? And then she waited for you to go to sleep. You understand what I'm saying? It's a real dynamic. I'm not sure this happened in other cultures. And I'm sure this probably happens in other cultures. <laughs> All right? No, I'm talking about when you can't you have no money. Hey, bro. Hey, Dad, I run up on my friends. You know, when you take your pocket and you turn it like inside out like this, this was my thing. Brother see me come like, oh, he's about to ask for some money. I'm like, bro, I'm serious. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, kind of tapped today, bro. Can I borrow a couple, couple of dollars? But even when we didn't have money, and we had to interact with one another, man. You brought like a 15 cent pack of now ladies. I know you look at me like, where are you going with this grip? 15 cent pack of now ladies. They come like nine in a pack. We never called them now ladies because we didn't speak the king's English. These are now ladies. <laughs> now I don't know where y'all from. I'm from New York. How y'all say? Nah. How you say? Nah. 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 <laughs> but culturally, we understood that. And I'm sure you're familiar with this right or wrong. Everybody should be familiar with that. But there's some aspects of who and what we are that a lot of people cannot grasp the concept of it. Like me, when I, my mom used to drag me to church, I never understood this whole concept about being born again because God don't make mistakes, right or wrong. For some strange reason, it didn't hit the Baptist church. God must have kind of came late. They didn't get the in-office memo because everybody had to get dipped in the water. I didn't understand the baptism thing. 
until I was well into my 30s, almost 40. I understand the water, now which we're going to talk about in a minute, all right? But I'm saying all that to say this, we never cursed the bridge that brought you across troubled waters. There's some people that Malcolm X and other people wrote off as Uncle Tom's as he debated them back in the day. But I'm not going to dismiss them, because I'm going to have to use those individuals as a tool to reach you today. You understand what I'm saying? Every birth is a rebirth of an ancestor, and we have to know that. Our ancestors speak to us from within us. All right, I'm going to move real quick. God is our first and greatest and primary ancestor, and should be the greatest and primary role model. All right? With this as a staple mark and a pillar in your consciousness, especially in your home, then we might not look for the LeBron James and the Jay-Z's of the world to be the role models. If you follow what I'm saying, all right? Dr. John, John Henry Clark said history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is a compass that they use to find themselves on the map of human geography. It tells them where they are, but more importantly, what they must be, especially in 2017. All right, regardless of who's running the White House, whoever was selected to be up in the White House, regardless, all right, we have to look beyond that, all right? Elijah Muhammad imparted on, on Malcolm X this, history is best qualified and most attractive to reward all our research because if we know what is, uh, we can better understand what it, pardon me, if we know what it was, we can better understand what it is and then we can carve out a future for ourselves and take control of our own destiny. I'm saying all that to say this, until the lion tag the historians, the tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. Always glorify the hunter. Can you imagine if the lion told a story? How different that story would sound to some people? If they did like the puppy remix or something to it? You understand what I'm saying? Our story needs to be told to us by us. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. What would be your story to your children 20 years from now? Yeah, how would it start? Would it start once upon a time with violence in the background? <laughs> nah. Would it start with those people that influence you and your soul journey through Mesa College and all that? What would your story sound like to your children, your grandchildren looking up at you? You understand what I'm saying? Will we include some of the people that got us through some uh, terrible, tragic, traumatic times? Or will we just forget them? Will Beyonce be part of that story? She was on the news last week for announcing that she was pregnant. You know how many Shamikas and Shalikwas I know in the hood that's pregnant right now and they didn't get that kind of play? Huh? <laughs> Come on, man, for real. Some of this stuff is really insane. Why is that on that? That's not news. Okay, it could be news to the inner family. Jay-Z's family, some other people. But come on, on CNN? You got to come across the ticker thing on the bottom? Come on, man. I got a chick pregnant too. Let me stop. I'm just saying. That's just not news to me. That's just not news, all right? But when we're talking about signs and symbols that affect your energy centers, all right? But because Beyonce announces that she's pregnant with a picture on Instagram, captivates and gets your attention and distracts you, all the other stuff went right on by it. This should have been the thing that should have been on the news. Black History Month, the same culprit for standing in the present, always moving forward, but always having to go back and fetch it. To go back and fetch it is a symbol of wisdom of learning from the past to build your future, all right? And it's very real, all right? What does school really teach children? Truth comes from authority. Intelligence is the ability to remember and teach to regurgitate it and spit it back, all right, so you can get the grade, all right? I used to tell my two sons, look, take two sets of notes. Take the notes from the teacher, the girls, you take that stuff back so you can get a good grade. We take the real sets of notes. You understand what I'm saying? By three, accurate memory and repetition are rewarded because you can remember some things. Non-compliance is, is punished. Conform, intellectual, and social, stepping outside of the box is punished. They don't want to think, because they're not teaching you um, how to think, they're teaching you what to think. Are you following what I'm saying? As soon as you step outside and start thinking for yourself, you fail. He punish you for that. All right? For example, this, we'll talk about that. The column is up here, this particular piece that he carries in his pocket is called the Manila. He's been carrying it for 20 some odd years. Ask him when you go downstairs. Why? 
Um, simply because he says this reminds him of his life's work, his life's mission. All right, like this reminds me of mine. The gold black power fist. All right, this will be me forever. Plain and simple. Um, it reminds me of John Carlos and Tommy Smith at the 1968 Olympics. You understand? All they did was this as a sign. You understand? And that resonated with me. But the Manila, this simple, I mean, this piece of um, this artifact right here, with the medium of exchange at that particular time, it can, it can actually purchase you. All right? A chest full of these can purchase everybody on this side of the room. But this is the value and the worth that they put on black lives. All right? Now, Fast forward that to somebody wearing a t-shirt that says Black Lives Matter. Well, you're damn right. Because if you reduce us down to this, and, and one simple Manila can purchase a black man or a black woman, you was treating us like Black Lives Never Matter. All right? At, this, at the same time, all the other lives around on the planet actually matter. All right? Which is critical. So the whole idea of the auction block uh, if you fast forward it today, it would be the, probably the NFL draft. Mm -hmm. Poor Falcons, who saw that last night? I didn't even discuss that. But anyway, I'm just saying, they go through the draft, they get treated the same way up on the auction block. All right? And then get branded. When I say get branded, I'm talking about brand loyalty. You can ask any woman in this room, all right? Let's see my mom. My mom used um, this perfume called ST Lauder. Not sure. You're familiar, you familiar with that? Yeah. I know that smell anyway, because every single one is <laughs> every single one. Brand loyalty is where I'm getting it. Alright? Man, black. What kind of sneakers you got on? Uh, Nike. How many Nikes you got at home? Uh, Talk to me, man. Don't be ashamed. <laughs> but at least four, five more pairs? Yeah. Brand loyalty. See what I mean? I don't even know it. Brand loyalty. We stick to these brands coming out of the womb. Oh, by the way, this is the way it's kind of structured. This is from my book, a tour page out of my book called The Human Brand. Brand loyalty, and we're loyal to these particular brands. We don't even know why. It resonates with a certain part of it. You understand? Know we call a certain energy center, and we stick with these particular brands. Alice Huxley explains that in his book, uh, Brave New World. We don't have time to go over each and everything, but if you can look on this particular baby, Coca Cola, the Mercedes, um, MTV, McDonald's, brand loyalty. They were probably sick with these brands until the time they're my age. Coming out of the womb, you these brands. Well, the same thing, same thing that happened to us on the plantation. All right. And in the first chapter of my book, I talk about, um, I talk about the symbols of hate. And in asking that particular question, when you walk into the museum, that's the first thing you have to deal with. So I ask people the question: If I was just to ask you this side of the room. Raise your hand if you can tell me what's one symbol of hate. Yes, sir, in fact. The Confederate flag. The Confederate flag is a symbol of hate. But if you ask somebody outside our cultural experience, they say no. It will argue you to death. Mm -hmm. I asked that question a few, few, few weeks ago, and someone said the cross. An argument ensued. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Because we got a few people in the room right now that's wearing crosses around their neck. All right? Rappers tattooing crosses all over their bodies. Up in the video, yanking and pulling on them. You understand what I'm saying? To a beat. And this is real. Spending thousands and thousands of dollars on gold encrusted, diamond encrusted crosses. All right? But you say it's a symbol of hate. All right? So some people can understand it because we suffer under this particular flag. Well, someone did mention that, sir. And someone said, no, the American flag is a symbol of hate. That argument ensued also. So I, so I said we should become symbol literary and try to understand both Confederate flag, the American flag, the cross, and all the other symbols. All right? Um, not to mention the whole idea of standing rock dealing with the American, um, Native American Holocaust. I remember one time I'm joking around because you know, I'm trying to make the conversation light. I said, black, I was just, uh, for some reason, I was just on a roll. And I'm uh, saying, black people, here we are. When people ask us what we mix with, we always say Indian. Mm -hmm. I got Indian in my family. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you may not be familiar with that, but black people just take Vaseline and slick their head out on the side and say they mix with Indian. <laughs> but we stand, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but we stand in Rockwood, now you were mixed with Indian all of a sudden, man. 
they had to stand by themselves. What happened to that Indian in you? <laughs> you lost that real quick, now, didn't you? Come on now, talk to me. <laughs> That's very real dynamic. Whether we are protesting on the continent, in America, peacefully, out, listen, James Baldwin admitted the fact that he was a homosexual. Uh, but he stood up not only for homosexuals, but he stood up for his right to be a black man in America speaking his peace, and he was not going to back down and told him, no, you can't call me a Negro. I'm a proud black man. All right? That's what the film is actually talking about. But he says, regardless of whether you say Dr. King was a, 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 a soldier that fought for uh, nonviolence and love, or he was Dr. Mex, which was the antithesis to that. Either way, both of them ended up in the daggone casket. Right or wrong. Right. And that's a very real dynamic. We should understand that particular thing. They had this thing called the Casual Killing Act. I may be familiar with this. That white people during, uh, pre, during, well not pre, during and post slavery can correct any black person. And in the act of correcting any black person, if that black person died, they definitely, they weren't responsible for that person. Now I'm talking about silly, stupid laws like you ever watch cartoons and you see the, uh, the cartoon character made run and stick his head in the barrel and laugh. But that was actually dynamic among us as people to call laughing matters. We couldn't laugh in front of white people. If you found something funny, you had to run, find a laughing barrel, stick your head in it, laugh, get it all out, then come back and present yourself. All right? And if being corrected by a white person at that time, um, correcting us, and if one of us died in the process, they were not charged with murder. The person who tried to live that way with it, this is not hundreds of years ago. This is like last year, 2016. Her friends tried to lynch her. All right? It's a very, very real dynamic that's going on today. So sometimes when you have this talk, you find some Negroes and some well-to-do white folks like, okay, well, that happened a long time ago. Can't you guys just kind of get over it? And I hear that. I thought I saw a T-shirt one time at Denver Airport. You guys need to just get over it. Well, this was kind of like last year. Someone tried to lynch us. It's a very real dynamic. I'm just, I put these two slides up here to give you a modern-day context as to what's going on, especially with the Casual Killing Act. All right? These gentlemen obviously committed a crime got locked up, got their mugshots taken. Some bright individual took their mugshot pictures, put it on targets, mass produced them, and, and, and put them on, um, and sent them to the gun range, the police firing range. And now they're using these particular gentlemen's faces on targets at the police firing range. Until someone spoke up about it. A fellow officer spoke up about it. It's a very real dynamic. Um, a couple of friends of mine, a couple of police officers around the, uh, the country got together and mass produced some of these statements for police to hand them out to young people. Just as a way to say, okay, you do have rights, but you need to know your rights. And what is wrong with that with arming young people, all right? The whole idea of you just being pulled over or you're being stopped and asked for ID and you're talking to the police officer, all right? You need to know your rights. So we're trying to mass produce these to give them out to young people. So let's dive back into this. The whole idea of this book without sanctuary is a book that was put together and comprised of different postcards of lynchings and castrations, all right? Uh, of which this particular um, information came out of this particular book, and they talked about the, the root word to the, the root um, definition to the word picnic. And of course, all y'all know picnic is simply pick a nigga. That they brought blankets and apple pie and brought all the children dressed up with baskets and they laid out to see which nigga they were going to pick that day to go to purchase to go home with them. So when you go on a picnic, think about this. All right, where the word originated from. All right, and this is very real. So in going over with brainwash, which is Tom Morell's work, we'll run through it real quick. It gives you almost a chronological kind of timeline as to what was going on. We talk about the 1600s, now we can go back beyond that, all right? And at this point, I think I need to say, uh, black history doesn't start with slavery. 
Black history doesn't start with slavery. Let me say it one more again. Black history doesn't start with slavery. All right, we can go back probably a million years prior to slavery. But when they give it to us in the textbook from good, educated, well-to-do white people in Texas that construct and put these books together for the rest of the country, yeah, right now, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've done the research, right now, they're trying to write slavery out of history. Literally write it out of history. Just like a, a few of us decided to get on a boat and come over here and work for white people for 400 years and get raped and murdered and all this kind of stuff. And we just so happen to just kind of want to be here going through that madness. But during the 1600s, slaves for sale posters became some of the first ads in America. So some of the first ads was posters, basically. Alright? Um, slave codes, which was legal brainwashing. Um, and then when you start talking about branding extensions, Coons, Toms, Bucks, Mammies, Pickaninnies, Jezebels, and these particular terms were put on black people. Alright? So by the time we started getting the knowledge of self, some of those firebrand revolutionaries started coming up teaching us who we are. Anytime that we wanted to resonate and interact with being black, they made it painful. So now in 2017, you don't even want to be black. You'd rather be everything else. All right, any time that made you resonate with being black, all right, they made it very painful. I don't have time to read everything, but if you could just look at some of the images. Even when Frederick Douglass kind of stood up and made his monumental speech on July 4th, and we started talking about um, being free and the Emancipation Proclamation, which the Emancipation Proclamation don't mean free. All right, it just means you're emancipated. That don't mean free. All right, and it's a proclamation. All right, because they were slaves after 1863, 1865. I'm sure you knew that, right? Okay. So we started going to resonate with who and what we really Oh, I'm talking about black being the essence of every color. I'm talking about black melody. I'm talking about that doorway, that gateway that all of us, all of the human family have to come through. All right? When we started resonating with that, they made it very painful. The black inferiority marketing strategy, all right, is what I'm talking about that Tom Burrell gave us. And then the old, when, when, when D.W. Griffin gave us the birth of a nation, the only thing we could resonate with as far as a symbol of hate with the white Klansman hoods. And why they took something sacred like the cross off the pyramid walls and used that as a symbol to burn? If it's such a sacred symbol, why are you burning it? All right? When they take out sacred symbols and use them for subversive purposes. All right? So the question now is asked, and I've asked a few people walking through the museum, when you look at the white Klansman hood, which hoodie looks suspicious to you? The hoodie that Trayvon Martin wore or the white hoods of the Klan? This is a question that we need to ask ourselves as Tom Morrell gives us this chronological history, culture of intimidation and death. All right? Not only with the silent film, Birth of a Nation, all right? but even when films started speaking to us and Paul Rosen and other people, people were speaking about what was going on in Hollywood, just the roles that we play, the stereotypical roles that we play. All right? We play some of those roles today, which I'm going to go over on in about 15 minutes. Even the whole idea of us working for white people and taking care of their children. There's a couple of images downstairs. Colin has a white baby in this hand with a bare-breasted black woman with the white baby on this nipple and, and white, a black baby on this one. All right? And that was a common occurrence and a very real kind of uh, thing that you saw on the plantation. But even when it comes to Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben's and all these other stereotypical images that they put on cereal boxes, and even when it came to sports, all right, Colin has a, um, a thing downstairs that says for, for whites, for colored people only, for whites only, all right? And it's a very, very real dynamic. So much so now, they don't have to put the sign up. We instinctively know I'm not welcome or wanted there, all right? The sad thing about this, and, and um, I fell victim to it also, growing up, um, that's the first thing we did when we got on the public bus. We always went to the back. You know, they wreaked havoc back there, playing music loud, doing what we wanted to do. But Rosa Parks fought and almost lost her life 
for black people to sit anywhere on the bus that we wanted to sit on the bus, especially during the 1970s with the black exploitation movies that came out. Fast forward up to today, all right, LeBron James on the cover of Vogue magazine, which when we sent the letter to LeBron James, letting him know that there's horns on the top of his head, and it's a depiction of this particular cover that was shot years ago, he just said, I'm happy to be on the cover of Vogue. All right? Plain and simple. Um, Khaled will tell you, man, the information that he's gathering of the, uh, the former first, the president and the first lady of the United States of America, it is ridiculous what white people did to Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. Painting them as apes and monkeys. And I'm talking about for the last eight years, all right? And this is a very, very real dynamic, showing you that, okay, these people haven't grown up. Peace, man, was good. All right? So how different would our education be if we went to school to learn to create jobs for ourselves? Dr. Amos Wilson, peace, queen, you good? Yes, yeah. All right. You didn't get anything from the lecture so far. Can we take away this? The society advises us to go to school, get a job, get married, get in debt, pay your work off the debt, have kids, retire at 63, and die. Mm -hmm. Now, my spirit speaks something else to me as a parent, a grandparent. You understand what I'm saying? You know, how about, how about you control your destiny? Step it out with your left foot forward, all right? With your mission statement and your purpose in front of you. No understanding who and what you are, all right? Or go to school if you want to go to school. How about being homeschooled? And not, not uh, being indoctrinated by the madness, where you got to go through a period of flushing this madness out. All right? How about start a business? Work your ass off for yourself. Hire some of your peeps, your people. All right? What's wrong with that dynamic? Travel the world. All right? Um, they a boss. Married boss. Have your children little bosses. You understand? What's wrong with that dynamic? So they don't have to work for someone else. Have boss children, retire at 40, and how about live? Do some of the things that you see them doing. We're not, we won't be able to bring that particular thing in fruition. If we don't understand that the information was passed down from our ancestors through brave leaders, all right, that gave us this information. And by the time it came and fell in our hands, the public enemy, we wrapped it in music that vibrational uh, universal language called music, vibratory frequencies and tones. It was kind of chaotic. But like, we had to use the vast language called Eng English to get it over to you, but it spoke to a different aspect of you. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, in one of our songs, he says, have you forgotten that once we were born here, we were robbed of our names, robbed of our language. We lost our religion, our culture, our God, and many of us, by the way we act, we even lost our minds. Mm. All right? And that's real to today, all right? Chuck D said, I'd rather be hated for what I'm, pardon me, hate, I'd rather be hated for what I am than love for what I am not, all right? Chuck D said, he also said, you can't change the people around you, then change the people around you. And that's real. We got this peer pressure thing happening going on, and we just kind of, these are, this is our first album cover we put out, all right? You can see a clear picture of this. You can see guns and all kinds of stuff up in this picture. Because we roll with cash in the hood. This crew right here is called the 98 Posse. All right? We want to go put it in that work. For real. Uh, this was our first album cover. You're going to get yours. We were trying to send that subtle signal. All right? But we held up a mirror to white Americans. This is what it looks like to us. All right? And then it seemed like every um, group that came after us that patterned themselves after that particular vibration spoke more and more in greater volume, all right? So by the time it came to Tupac, it was in your face loud, and he's spitting at the camera, all right? And that's very real dynamic. By the time it came to it, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back, all right? Hate the shade of criminal. We actually showed America what it actually look like to us, all right? And if you look at the faces of these people, they get my just everyday accounts. Everyday occurrence. Uh, so there's a poison going on. Public Enemy, one of the Public Enemy songs uh, off of one of our albums. And it spoke, it speaks volumes. Even when it came to uh, 
Most of my heroes don't appear on those stamps. That particular dynamic's changed because now you see black people on stamps. You only look at it as a small thing, all right? But it really means something when they see Barack Obama and his wife and two black children, like this family sitting at this table over here, walking out of the White House. You understand what I'm saying? Even when it comes to Arizona, we did this song by the time I get to Arizona as a protest because they didn't, they wouldn't uh, recognize Dr. Martin Luther King and celebrate as a hardest birthday as a holiday. We had to make that happen and force the issue. All right, they were kicking and screaming, but they gave in. They had no other choice. By the time the NWA movie came out, there was murmuring and talking and lip service about the public enemy movie, which we understood that was going to happen anyway. But can you imagine the public enemy story? Well, just say, can you imagine the public enemy story for real? <laughs> but anyway, when the NWA movie came out, the newscasters were saying hip hop film had long lines but no violence because they was expecting the violence because of what NWA stood for. Why? Because after police wasn't a very nasty, rude song, it was very politically correct. F-U-C-K, fornication under the consent of King. But it spoke volumes to us. Because all of us, regardless of where we at, Oklahoma and some other places in Michigan, we had that same interaction with police officers. All right? This was a book that I put out several years ago, I believe in 08. The house burned down in 08, I lost the entire book. I revamped it in 09 and put the book back out. And even six months after that, I pulled it back in and put 700 images in it because I wanted to resonate with young people. Because young people understand signs and symbols and how it speaks to them. Because the picture's worth a thousand words. When I pulled it back, I put a chapter in it called The Illuminati's Tickle of Hip Hop, and I began that talk with young people so they can understand signs and symbols and how it affects us. I'm watching the clock, I got 20 more minutes, all right? This is book one. I recently released this book, Symbology, Psychological Covert War on Hip Hop, book two, all right? And I had to step it up, because young people instantly got it. And they calling me with deep kind of stuff, because now they're doing research and they're reading, all right? Uh, I subtitled this book, of course, Psychological Covert War on Hip Hop, because psychology is the study of the psyche, and the psyche is not your mind, but your brain. The psyche is your soul. All right, but I had to add another subtitle to it, which is a reference book of subliminal seductive manipulation of consciousness and cultural retrograde. All right, they're actually using our culture while we're asleep and distracted. They're taking signs and symbols of our culture and turning it back on us. Right, and now we're arguing with some of the things that we may say. I've heard an argument about Africa. I'm talking about, you know, some brothers with Africa, or you might see a sister with the African earrings. They said, well, why are we wearing the shape of Africa? You don't see white people wearing the shape of Europe. <laughs> we're not even going to talk about that. But anyway, I'm just saying, when you are lost people, and knocked upside the head and put in the holes of shit and dragged to America and you robbed of everything, you're gonna have that discussion until a teacher comes along and teaches that. So when I talk about manipulation of consciousness and cultural retrograde, all right, that needs to be explained. So we need to have a particular dialogue. I based the book on Dr. Francis Cress Wilson's work, the ISIS papers in the nine areas of people activity. I know some of y'all gotta go back to class and you can't stay long, but give me 15 more minutes. Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war are the nine areas of people activity that Dr. Frances Cress Wilson taught for over 40 something years until she made her transition into the ancestral realm. Right, am I talking too fast? Because you look at that perplexed look. No, I'm good? Okay. <laughs> I, pull, I put this in the lecture only an hour or so ago because I thought it was very interesting that when you talk about LeBron James having the horns, as you see, Donald Trump has the horns on the top of his head also. Now, without speaking the bastard language called English, we're talking in symbols now. When someone sees this on the newsstand, what do you think they'll think when they see the horns on Trump's head? Automatically, he's the devil, I'm wrong. And we need to kind of think in terms of symbols right now, just for the next few minutes. So the first degree in the book is right uh, racism, white supremacy, and symbols of hate. 
All right. And the brother so eloquently put it, he gave us a symbol of hate, which was, uh, what did you say was the Confederate flag? Yeah. Okay. So I just kind of put some other symbols of hate. How come when we see the noose, we don't think this is a symbol of hate? A minute ago, when college campuses, they were hanging nooses around That's professors right. and, and doors, doorknobs. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, you're right. What do they say? Because they know the symbol speaks volumes. <laughs> so they don't have to write a note. They are, it doesn't need to be on the, on the intercom. They just leave the noose around it because we already know what this means. Am I right or wrong? Right. Right. All right, so it's a very real dynamic. So when we have to decode stuff like this for the little ones, all right, because mind you, they don't have no filter. I'm talking about Day Day Twan, Man Man, and Quick Quick in there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they don't have no filter, man. We have to be the ones to explain these particular things to them. So if they see this, they may not understand what that means. <coughs> All right? Uh, if you go to Mill Ave, there's a Spinelli's with one of those hanging up in, in the bar. Oh, for real? Pizza place, yeah. Spinelli's a brother? No, so I'm going to talk about something funny for a second. It was my brother. You know what I'm saying? I understand that. But yeah, so we have to be able to understand what this actually means, not looking through your intelligent, sophisticated, well mature lens. All right, that's why I pulled the book back and wrote it for a 14 year old. I wanted to see these symbols through the lens of these two little ones right here. Imagine what that looked like to a seven year old and having to explain that to them. All right? Imagine what this looks like. I hope the people from the other school don't see this. I had this discussion the other day, and I was scratching my head. It gave me a headache, man. I asked the audience like I'm going to ask y'all, can y'all help me decode this and tell me what this means? What do y'all see when y'all look at this? Immediately somebody said, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> I said, that's gangster. I see that. <laughs> but what else did you see? I asked the audience to look in it instead of at it. Yes, sir. Is it, is it as, um, basically, it's similar to the fact that they both kill the black people? Like, you know, you have... Well, obviously, what I would see is the fact that white moves first on the chessboard because he's moving. He's in motion. He's acting. He's in action. There's an action. All right? Of course, you see, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Of course you see both of them are boys in the hood. <laughs> right? But what, what else do you see? What does Cass do here if he's in? What he has on. Right. I was thinking about our next movie. Exactly. And the fact that if this is the game of chess, if this is the game of life, living in fear of extension, there's no need for you to curse your opponent out. It's best for you to think three steps ahead to know how to make your next move to navigate through racism and white supremacy, am I right? Yes. And we need to understand that as such. So dealing with some of the symbols of it, now listen, some of this you might see in the museum, some of you might, I'm just asking you to just kind of look through the lens of the little ones. Could you do that for me real quick? Mm -hmm. While we break down some of the symbols that's in my book? Bank of America, I should have made that color. I'm sorry. But if you look at the, and I wanted to break down the color, the red and the blue, the crips and the bloods, Democratic Party, Republican Party, same, same thing, same concept. But if you look at Bank of America, you look in it, it's a square. It's the square of Freemasonry, but Bank of America is three number 11s, which is the number 33. Who died at 33? Why the Masons can't get past 33 without moving into another phase of the Masonic Order? Come on now, this has meaning. We can't break it all down today, but it has meaning. See, as long as you've been looking at Bank of America, you never noticed that was three number 11s. All right? So let's talk about what that, some of those things. So let's just look at some of the things that we see every day. The App Store. The App Store is the Masonic symbol. The Masonic symbol is actually the Pontiac symbol turned upside down, which is the Klan's hood. And actually, the KKK is three number 11s. Don't run out of here saying Professor Rich said KKK members on Bank of America. Don't you know? <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to make you simple literate right now. Is that cool with everyone? I got 10 more minutes. All right? I'm just going to go over some of the symbols. I'm not going to worry about reading some of this stuff. Of course, I wonder why the Dodge truck, uh, so many men are attracted to Dodge truck because this is what it looks like. Uh, when you break the symbol down in our sophisticated minds. 
Because we experience that every other week, every other month, right or wrong. <laughs> Y'all didn't catch that, I'm going to move forward. <laughs> Some of you are going to get that. If you're wearing a little yellow helmet and licking the window on a little yellow bus, we'll talk about it a little bit later. All right? One of the symbols of the Lost Association of Genocide and History, where people who thought differently were repressed by threats of psychological abuse. For many years, millions of people, including Jews, homosexuals, the sick, etc., etc., were massacred, and the other symbol is not the symbol of Nazism. A lot of people have suffered under the cross, and only one person got it. Thanks, bro. Really appreciate that. So when you're talking about symbols of hate, in the book I go deeper because it's not talking about how Nazis and, uh, and the other people, Citizens Council, use the number 88. I never knew that until I started doing research. And I always used to see the white boys with the number 88. And I'm trying to figure out what does that actually mean? It actually means Heil Hitler. 88. All right? All right, buckle your seatbelt real quick. I got 10 more minutes, y'all. Why is every liquor associated with a gun? Cobra, there's a Cobra gun. Colt 45, there's a Colt 45 gun. Magnum, there's a gun as a man. Condom's named after the Magnum. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm wearing them in the room. I'm not saying, but I'm just saying. Why is that? <coughs> there we got people like Silly D. Williams, I mean Billy D. Williams, <laughs> uh, promoting the madness. All right? And then from Billy D. Williams, fast forwarded, Snoop Dogg and other people. I mean, there's a whole bunch of rappers that promote the St. Ives, liquor, more liquor, all right? But it's a very real dynamic, but if you do your research and you roll your mind back to ancient Kemet, I see they take our sacred symbols and they use them for subversive purposes. Our sacred symbols, do your race, all right? Tapping into that third eye. If I had time, I would bring this all down, but these are our sacred symbols that they use for subversive purposes. I don't have time to break it all down, but let me kind of find some symbol. I don't have time to go into the whole idea of the entertainment industry. Of course, as you can see, LeBron James with the horns on his head, Oprah throwing up the signs on her handless. Did you see the uh, Super Bowl last night? Mm -hmm. Halftime, Lady Gaga? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. What did you recognize? What stood out? Come on, talk to me. Because it's a black woman. Huh? Well, obviously, you know, black people. <laughs> <laughs> huh? No. The lights. And if you look at the thousand, right, remember what you lights. know that. Yeah. Google that, the thousand yeah. points of lights. And you tell me what it means. My phone number is 678-557-2919. Call me on it. When she first hit the stage, I said, OK, I know what this is. They're speaking to one another. Right past our consciousness. The thousand points of light. If you look that up, you say, wow. I see where he was going with that. All right? Let me skip through some of this stuff. Of course, you've noticed know about Beyonce and Jay-Z. This was a boot. They were kicking in Jewish people's doors at the synagogue and was leaving the boot print, all right? But Jewish people were being organized, tracked down the boot manufacturer, and had the boot discontinued. Why? Because on the bottom of the boot, there are swastikas. But if you look at the real meaning of what a swastika is, it's not even negative. It comes from our sacred symbols that they have taken and used for subversive purposes. But Black Boots was kicking their doors in, and they contacted the company and discontinued it. Probably bought the company and burned the boots. All right? But if you look at Chase Manhattan Bay, it's the same thing as the swastika. Mm -hmm. GE. <laughs> if you look at it instead of at it, uh, Google Chrome is the six. Six, six, all right? Mm -hmm. um, Time Warner, A-I-G, without looking at this, say it to yourself, A-I-G, all right? Of course, the A is in the shape of the pyramid, the capstone with the all same I, that's on your dollar bill, all right? And of course, the uh, I-G, is G in the middle of the Messiah symbol. These symbols jump right out at you once you become symbol living. Um, America Online, all right? The all saying I am Lucifer on the dollar bill. But we see it every day, but we just can't decode it to figure out what it actually means. But they gave us the pyramid of the uh, food combining <laughs> charts. Of course, it's in, the, it's in the form of the pyramid, all right? 
this would kill me when I was doing the research to put it in the book. I used to go to Cracker Barrel. But when I started studying what the logo meant, I'm like, it didn't make sense to me. But it actually do. It's a cracker standing by a barrel. <laughs> cracker Barrel. <laughs> well, I didn't make this up, man. It's cold here. Don't worry about it. The white guy in the back room, he ain't uncomfortable. You know why? Because the cracker wasn't a derogatory term to white people. It was a title. When they called that person to come beat the slave, his title was called a cracker. That's like saying, can you all have the accountant come down to my office? Same thing. The cracker blew the whip and he knew how to crack the whip. He was the cracker. Now some of y'all may use it in a derogatory way today, but that's the cracker bar. And it says an old ass country store. <laughs> For real. Just a few more symbols. Arm and hammer. I'm sure you use Arm and Hammer baking powder and baking soda in your kitchen. Right or wrong. But did you know that there was a man? His name was Armand Hammer. Call me and tell me what Armand Hammer was responsible for. A number is 678-557-2919. It's a circle, within a circle, within a circle, within a square. And where could you find that symbol at? Look on your dollar bill, it's there. These people are not doing this by accident. I have seven minutes. Salvation Army. The Salvation Army is a red shield. Look up Salvation Army and put in it on your Google search the occultic meaning to the red shield. And you're going to come up with that old story of Robin Hood. You remember Robin Hood? What did Robin Hood do? Robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. Well, the red shield, which is the Rothschilds, do the opposite. They rob from everybody <laughs> to inflate their own bank account. Rothschild means red shield in German. This is real. See, when you know the symbols and what it means, it starts to make sense to you now. And all these symbols are out there in the world that we live in, and they're pulling on your energy centers. Pulling on your energy centers. The 13 stripes of the flag are the 13 families of the Illuminati. Not by accident. The original American flag was a snake. Go look it up for yourself. A snake that they broke up to represent the different states that made up the American flag, and their mantra was, don't tread on me. But if you turn the snake backwards, like I did, it's 666. Sign of the devil. They're not doing these things by accident. I went over tarot cards, what led to your deck of cards with the four different um, suits. Hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades. As long as you've been playing cards, did you ever think, why? And when you shoot dice, did you ever think, why? Like, why four suits? And then even when you look at uh, basketball and football team, I'm talking about NFL, which is the number three. I guarantee you, 80% of the people in this room got three names. Excuse me, what's your full name, sir? Aaron Wendell Porter. See what I mean? Good old Christian. You two, what's your full name? Three names. Why three? You ever think about that? Why three colors in the flag? Why would the police pull you over, take you down, down, and give you the third degree? It's Masonic. It's the third degree of Freemasonry. Three square meals a day. Why the meals gotta be square? Why the boxes in the boxing ring? Why is it a ring but a square? You ever think about these things? These are all the things I put in the book. Well, let's break this down real quick with the four minutes I have left. All right? NFL, National Football League, equals. 14 plus 6 plus 12 equals 12 plus 6 on 41 equals 13. NBA, 13. NHL, 13. By accident, right? Just by coincidence. 13 families of the Illuminati. All the sports, PGA, NASCAR, all of them equal 13. That's not by accident. It's not by accident, but you're not going to learn that at Mason <laughs> Community College. All right? The 76s, 7 plus 6 equals what? 13. 13. 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati. Of course, I turned the Yankee symbol upside down. You see what that is? Penis and womb. It's sexual, and it stimulates your lower energy centers. All right? Even Gmail, the letter M, is the same apron as the Messiah order. We look at it. Same M. All right? I got three minutes left. All right, that's where if I was you, where would you end up? People play games all the time. I played TikTok all my little life. I never knew that was the magic square. 
The game of tic-tac-toe is a magic square, and all equals up to 15. 1 plus 5 is 6. All right? Nine squares. Where's the nine squares in the world? City of the nine squares. Can anybody tell me? New Haven, Connecticut is the city of the nine squares. What secret societies in New Haven, Connecticut? Skull and bones. We have to know these things. All right? Those squares are the worship of Saturn. All right? Saturn worship the black cube. You see the black cube in the holy city of Mecca. All right? The Ka Ba, the spirit and the soul. You also see the black cube when you graduate from this institution and you wear that cap and gown. It's called the marcher board, which the Masonics use to lay cement. <laughs> All right? It's the circle within a square. Anytime you graduate, how do you do, what do you get when you graduate? A degree. All right? That's how the Masons move, in degrees. Right on the wall now. And this is, this is real, but it's mind control at its finest. And everyone in authority in this society wears black. Not black skin, but black robes, judges, police, black uniform, military, black uniform. Everyone in authority wears black. See, but you already have it, but you don't know that you're in authority over your own life. Even when you break down a police officer's hat, looking down at a police officer's hat, all right, when you get hit with the Billy Club, it's the double square of Freemasonry. All right, it's the octagon. The same thing as the stop sign. All right? Even when you're spending money that you don't have, if you look at the, the symbol for the money, it's actually the worship of ISIS. I S S I. ISIS. All right? So these are some of the things I had in my book. I can go deeper, but I don't have a lot of time. We're going to open up for Q&A. This will be the last thing we're going to show if I have volume. Volume here. I don't. So right now, maybe you can just look at it. I'm sure some people have saw this before. See, now, these two little ones over here looking at this. How old are they? It's eight and six. Six and eight. <coughs> it may not know how to decode this. All right, payday with a chocolate bar with nuts. All right, coming up with private parts, floating nuts and all this other kind of stuff. All right, it helps you get you through your day, expose yourself to payday. What does that actually mean to a six and eight year old with no filter to decode that? What does that actually mean? All right, so we have to be the ones to become simple literate to explain so many things to them. Blessed are those that struggle, oppression is worse than the grave. It's better to live and die for a noble cause than to live and die a slave. Sami Sana, thank you very much for listening for the last hour. Of your <laughs>